Syria's Muslim Brotherhood, which had a stronghold in Hama, had always been opposed to the Ba'ath Party's rule over Syria, and it led a violent campaign against regime officials and institutions. On the morning of February the 3rd, 1982, Syrian military units surrounded the city. And for the next 27 days, Hama was bombed from the air and ground. Much of the city was destroyed. Estimates of the number of dead vary between 10,000 and 40,000 people. It's hard to get an accurate figure because very few reporters were allowed near Hama. Well, one journalist who did make it to the outskirts of the city was Robert Fisk. He joins us now live from Beirut. Um, Robert, good to have you with us. Uh, the Hama massacre described, of course, as one of the worst war crimes ever to have t taken place in, in the Middle East. Uh, I'm guessing you still remember very clearly the scenes that you saw 30 years ago. Yes, um, I think probably the dead were below 20,000. Uh, the figure keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, I got into the city because I was in a taxi coming from Aleppo and two military officers asked the taxi driver if he would take them and me of course into the center of, um, of Hama and I said yes yes of course we will and in fact for 18 minutes I sat beside their tank unit as their tanks shelled mosques in the old city at which point the Mahabharat the intelligence service started to arrive and I decided it was time to get out but I did actually witness it uh, I actually had an old lady who climbed in my car with a child and the child was hungry and I gave it a Mars bar you know a little chocolate bar and the woman seized it and ate it herself there were a lot of tanks with wounded soldiers on it was a big battle um, I have to say that I'd been to Hammer before the siege and many members of the Bath Party their families had been murdered by the Muslim Brotherhood. It wasn't a black and white story, but it was a huge uh, death toll and uh, the smoke hung over the city. It was a very frightening place. I did see it. Mm. I, I guess I'm sorry I saw it in many ways. Yeah, uh, and, and th this was, I mean, it was very much a scorched earth policy uh, ordered by Bashar al-Assad's father, <coughs> but directly supervised by his uncle who was in charge of the security forces. Yes, Rifat al-Assad, who now lives in luxury in central London, protected by David Cameron, my own beloved Prime Minister. Amazing, isn't it? Um, yes, Rifat al-Assad's special forces were indeed there, and I could recognize them by their dark red um, maroon uniforms. Uh, they were indeed there, and, and uh, at the time, no one made any secret of that. Now, Rifat uh, allegedly says he wasn't involved. His son, whom I know, says he wasn't involved, but he clearly was, and as I say, he now lives in luxury in London. That's an interesting thing to remember when you think of how much scorn is now poured on the Syrian regime by the British government. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, you look at the international reaction and the Arab reaction now to what's going on in Syria. I wonder what was the reaction 30 years ago to what happened then? You know, at the time, um, Carter was the president and the Americans were very happy for the Assad regime to crush a Muslim uprising in Hama. Nobody was complaining at all. Uh, it, the odd thing about it was that I got back to Damascus from Hama and went to the Ministry of Information uh, because I thought I ought to tell the minister, who was, uh, he's now dead, he was called Iskander, Ahmed Iskander, what I'd just seen. And as I approached the ministry, it actually blew up in front of my face. Later on, I was condemned by Syrian radio for being the big liar of Hammer. I confronted the minister who said, no, no, we know it's all true. Uh, only true friends could have this argument. It was a strange situation where the West and the Syrian regime were very much together at that stage. Do you think we'll ever see some kind of international reckoning or, or someone being held responsible for what happened in Hammer 30 years ago? You know, I think people get away with war crimes. I think Hafez al-Assad did. I think Rifat al-Assad, as I say, he's living in luxury in London. He's got away with it. It's only if we want to get these guys and, and knock them off their perch that we actually follow through on this, as in Libya, where we were very happy to see, we the West, were very happy to see Gaddafi uh, cruelly murdered. Um, you know, there's a lot of hypocrisy behind all this, including the story of Syria now, I'm afraid to say. 
Robert, good to speak to you as ever, uh, even though those memories are quite disturbing. Thank you very much indeed for that. Robert Fisk in Beirut there.